Let's take a look at this problem. We have a throttling valve in series with a heat exchanger. Let's take a look at our illustration. Right here is our throttling valve, and here is our heat exchanger. And everything operates at steady state. That's good. Saturated liquid refrigerant 134A enters the valve. So over here is inlet state 1, and it's saturated liquid refrigerant 134A, and it's coming in at a pressure P1 of 9 bar. Good. And it's throttled. Now this is a new word maybe to you, but that's what that valve is doing. It's throttling it. It's uh, dropping the pressure at P2 such that the pressure at P2 is 1 bar. You can put that into the illustration, 1 bar. So it came in at 9, went out lower pressure at 1 bar. How did that happen? It's just a restriction. Um, it's a pressure drop. Uh, you've all have experience with valves, I hope, even from turning faucets on and, uh, and you know, water control. Anyway, we have the refrigerant then enters the heat exchanger, and it's on the top side if you want to try and distinguish the sides of the heat exchanger. It doesn't mix with the fluid. They're showing it staying inside of its own section of the heat exchanger and then exiting at state 3. Okay and it exits at a temperature of 10 degrees C, and there's negligible pressure drop between state 2 and 3, the same pressure. That's a constant, uh, not a constant, common assumption in heat exchanger analysis. Okay, yeah, that there's no pressure drop. In a separate stream, liquid water. So now we have a problem where we have refrigerant in one side, or part of the problem, and water in another side of the problem. And it comes in at 1 bar and 25 degrees C into this heat exchanger and they label it state 4. I like that. Instead of renumbering the states and saying, oh, this is state 1 for water and this is state 1 for refrigerant. I think it's better just to go ahead and have state 4. And that comes in and then it goes out at state 5. Again, it stays within its side. It doesn't mix. And that's what they're showing by the illustration here in that heat exchanger and it comes out colder but the same pressure so it comes out at the same bar one bar pressure so at 15 compared to 25 it's coming out colder right away you could tell something about that refrigerant well it's 10 degrees C going out um, it's going to be colder so this is if you want to think about it this is the cold side and this is the warmer hot side of that heat exchanger and inside the heat exchanger, there's heat transfer from the hot fluid to the cold fluid. But we, we don't really need to worry about that too much. We just understand what's happening in that heat exchanger. Okay. Determine the temperature in degrees C of the refrigerant at the exit of the valve. So they want us to find T2. And what is the mass flow rate of that refrigerant? This would be like M dot of the refrigerant going through, through the valve, through the cold side of that heat exchanger. Okay, well, how are we going to solve this problem? Well, um, it's really not a, a much on the mass balance. It's more on the energy balance. And we can have a couple different control volumes for energy balance. You can have a control volume right here around that valve. And we should do that and see what it shows us for the energy balance. So for this control volume around the valve, the energy balance around the valve gives us uh, the rate of change of energy in the control volume with respect to time. You ask yourself, is there any heat transfer coming into the control volume? Is there any shaft power going out? No. We only have one mass flow rate. Right? It's bringing in its enthalpy at state 1. It's taking out its enthalpy at state 2. And we're neglecting kinetic and potential energy effects. So, let's say, steady state. There's no heat transfer with the surroundings. There's no shaft power in or out. And I have 0 is equal to m dot times h1 minus h2. And you conclude that h1 is equal to h2. So what do we conclude? Well, we don't conclude that it's isothermal, no. A lot of students will think, hey, you had no Q. Because Q dot's equal to zero, it must be isothermal. No, 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 no. It's 
not constant temperature, T1 is not equal to T2. No, 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 that's not true. But a lot of students will think that because there's no heat transfer. Okay, but what there's no heat transfer and no work, and the first law shows us that the enthalpy doesn't change. The enthalpy inlet is equal to the enthalpy exit. We would not call that isothermal. We would call it isenthalpic. Isenthalpic. Constant enthalpy. All right. So there we have concluded something about state two. Well, if you go to the state principle, if I'm interested in getting the temperature at two, I would say from the state principle, if I know two intensive independent properties like pressure at two, one bar, and the enthalpy at two coming from H1, I can look that up, saturated liquid refrigerant, that's how I find T2. That's how I find T2. All right, before I put numbers down, let's continue and talk through this problem. The next control volume you're going to do is around this heat exchanger. All right, what's that going to tell us? Well, first of all, is there any heat transfer from the surroundings into that heat exchanger? No, that's equal to zero. Is there any shaft work power going out? No, and it's, at e and it's operating at steady state. And so when you write it and you do a little bit of algebra, you can get a very um, readable statement here. I'm just going to write energy balance for that heat exchanger. And what you can do, is, you know, starting from equation like this, general equation right up here, you'll get that the mass flow rate of the refrigerant times its enthalpy going out at 3 minus enthalpy coming in at 2 is equal to, that's really thinking about the rate of heat transfer being picked up by the cold side is equal to the ma mass flow rate of the water that's going this way through the system times the enthalpy coming in at 4 minus the enthalpy going out at 5. What you should do is start from the general equation here like that for the first law for that new control volume around the heat exchanger and prove this to yourself. And then once you get this equation, you should be able to read it and say, oh, this is really Q dot going into the refrigerant. This is really Q dot going out of the water. I mean, you could draw and do this, do this, uh, a separate control volume, which is just half of that heat exchanger from the perspective of the water. Or do a half of that control volume just from the perspective of the refrigerant. Now you see some Q dots going out of the warm water and into the refrigerant and those two q dots are the same and that's what i'm reading in this equation right here and encouraging you to see too okay so now you look at our equations and you say we're interested in calculating the mass flow rate of the refrigerant well the mass flow rate of the refrigerant is equal to the mass flow rate of the water times the enthalpy of four minus enthalpy five and the enthalpy 3 minus enthalpy 2. We see this often in engineering where, oh, you're asked to calculate one mass flow rate. Well, it's equal to the other mass flow rate times some fraction or ratio. I shouldn't say fraction. This could be greater than 1. But it's some ratio of changes in enthalpy. Okay, so this problem really boils down to getting the enthalpies. I like to organize property valuations in tables. I probably didn't leave enough room. I'm going to scoot down to get a little bit more room here. We know the problem statement already. Okay. And so I would just do this. I would say, how many states do I have? I have state one, two, and three. Pressure, I like to put a column in, put it in bar. That's fine. Temperature, degree C. Quality, because I think it may be important here. But the key one is enthalpy in kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. And then all of these are for refrigerant. But let's put our values. So it's 9 bar, then 1 bar, and 1 bar. And it's saturated liquid. So the quality of saturated liquid, you can think of as 0. And then you can get that enthalpy. No problem. That's H of F at the 9 bar, 99.56. Then we already did the analysis of this control volume. 
and showed that it's isenthalpic, 99.56. But the, temp the pressure is lower. If you take a look, this enthalpy of 99.96 falls between H of G and H of F for the one bar pressure. Hence, you conclude that state two is two phase, two phase liquid vapor. And you can then calculate the quality using the enthalpy. So this quality then would be um, the enthalpy minus H of F divided by H of G minus H of F. And when you do that, the quality comes in uh, about 0.3872, meaning mm, roughly 38%, 39% of the mass that came in here in the liquid state after it goes out of that throttling valve at state two has been flashed. It's been turned into vapor by mass. A little less than 40% of the refrigerant by mass is now in the vapor state. And that remains the 60% or a little bit more than 60% is in the liquid state. And it's all cold. It's all at that saturation temperature. So T2 is the T sat at the one bar and so that temperature is negative 26.4. I could write that and box it, but there's the answer right there. Let me skip the step of you know, putting it in a box. I think we are I'm running out of room. Okay. Now, we want to continue this table because we need to get all these enthalpies to solve for the mass flow rate. Okay. All right. So we go back here and uh, uh, it's this state 3. And state three, they give us that its temperature is 10 degrees C at one bar. Well, it's superheated vapor. That's like you know, superheated vapor, two phase. What was this one? This was saturated liquid. Okay. And what we were doing was for the refrigerant, we were using table uh, A11, table A11 in our textbook, and now table A12 for superheated refrigerant properties. And you get to the right pressure block, look for that temperature line, 10 degrees C, you find that the enthalpy is 261.43. So it's like we have the H2 and the H3 needed in this equation. What we need is the H4 and the H5. Well, that's even easier. So at 4 and 5, I know that this is a change in properties maybe I should say this is now water and this was refrigerant 134a as a note but uh, I would just go ahead and one bar and, and one bar and it comes in at 25 degrees C and it goes out at 15 degrees C well you can get the enthalpy at state 4 that's approximately H of F at that temperature of 4 likewise for the temp enthalpy at state 3 so it comes in 104.89 this is both of these are subcooled liquid it's just liquid water 62.99 now I have the other two enthalpies boom, boom, H4 and H5 the mass flow rate of the water if I scroll back it was given in the problem statement the mass flow rate of 1.4 kilograms per second known and I'm going to uh, skip the step of writing down the solution, but the solution comes in at the mass flow rate of the refrigerant is 0 0.362 kilograms per second. Well, with that, hopefully the problem um, you found helpful. Thank you.